RCR with Paul Brennan, Reality Check Radio. Friday morning, time for our political panel. Gosh, that week goes quick, doesn't it? And I'd like to welcome in Olivia Pearson. Hi, Olivia. Hello, Paul. How are you? With that I'm good. sexy voice you've got today. Oh, yes, yes. How <laughs> wrecky. Marty. G'day, Marty. Marty. Hi, Paul. How are you today? I'm and good. And Cam. Today. Hi, Cam. Good morning, Paul. How are you? I'm very good. Um, th- boy, a lot to choose from this week, right? Yeah. Oh, it's just disaster. Busy week. Everywhere. Busy week. <laughs> on, on every front. Tell you what really got me interested this week is is um, Yevgeny. Is it Prigozhin or Prigozhin? Prigozhin. 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 I've been watching his videos over the time mainly during that Bakhmut thing, he struck me as, how would you describe it? Quite, well, he's obviously a very hard. Well, he's a blowhard, but he looks like a tough man. Tough man. You'd have to be, wouldn't you? Well, you'd have to be tough to decide that you're going to take out the head of the Russian army in Moscow by decamping from Ukraine, going back across the border into Russia, and then driving up the freeway <laughs> towards, <laughs> used the freeway. towards Moscow and nobody stopped him. <laughs> that was, you know, that's what I found astonishing that here he was essentially having an industrial dispute with his employer <laughs> and working to rule and uh, heading off to Moscow. And to rule. <laughs> he's kind of got away with it because they said, oh, no, he's going to Belarus to go into retirement and we're going to move a whole lot of his troops into the Russian army. But he's still alive. And Putin, from my viewing of it, someone might disagree with this, but he looks diminished as a result of this because there was just no reply from, from the, uh, you know, the organs of the state in Russia against Prigozhin as he marched, marched up to within a, 200 miles of Moscow. He's too popular. Well, is he? I don't know. It was, it was, it was odd. <clears throat> you go, Marty. Sorry. No, I was just going to say, he decamped to St. Petersburg, and, and I did hear rumblings that Stalin stayed even 28 miles from the German front lines. So there, there was the comparison made, I understand, in Russia. Yeah. It was made, but it was it was shocking that he waltzed into Rostov. I mean, that's the HQ of where the war fought in the Ukraine, but he marched into Rostov with, what, 4,000 troops surrounding all the HQ buildings um, un, unblocked. I mean, I found that really odd, um, but maybe that's just trust. I mean, maybe nobody, you know, thought that he would do what he was going to do. But um, it wasn't a coup. And nor was it a civil war as we watched the whole Western media lick its chops in anticipation that it might be, but it was certainly dramatic. Um, he's a well-known loudmouth and has made noises that the war isn't being fought hard enough in the Ukraine and he's wanted decisive action to go hard and end it. Um, but remember that in March 2022, only one month into the war, um, Russian and Ukrainian negotiators were discussing a 15-point peace deal that would have involved Kiev formally renouncing its ambition to join NATO um, and accepting limits on, on its armed forces in exchange for a ceasefire and the withdrawal of Moscow's troops and security guarantees from the West. But then um, Prime Minister at the time, Boris Johnson, went suddenly flying on the surprise visit into Kiev um, and talked Zelensky out of doing any peace deals, um, instead urging him to fight on. Um, Boris made two points at that time, one that Putin was a war criminal and thus um, shouldn't be negotiated with, which I think was nuts. And the second, that even if Ukraine were willing to sign agreements on guarantees with Putin, they, meaning the UK, Germany, France and NATO, were not prepared for that. Um, so there ended that potential for a peace negotiation over a year ago. How did he persuade him in one day? Probably flattered that giant ego, I would say, you know. Money. Well, he, well, he promised him He promised him full support with weapons. Well, that's working out well. That's working out really well. So here Prigozhin, who was, you know, 
is now disgruntled, um, sent 4,000 odd troops to go into, well, to march to Moscow from Rostov. Um, you know, he claimed that um, helicopters were used to attack um, some of his men. I believe that's true, and people did die. I don't know how many. Um, but here's the thing. When Putin addressed the nation in that speech that evening, I have never seen him so incandescent with rage. Um, Putin is always so cold and emotionless, but you could see his rage beneath his ever chilly exterior um, bubbling away. And Prigozhin called a halt to the Moscow march and the Wagner group are very popular with Russian people. Um, they want an alpha dog like um, Prigozhin on the ground in the theater of war and who could blame them. Um, but there are other fighters in the Wagner group from Germany, from Serbia, um, other it's like the French Foreign Legion kind yeah. of thing, isn't it? Yeah, well, they're, a private mili- they're, a private, Legion. they're a private military contractor um, without the ears and graces of a Blackwater or something like that. You know, um, well, they're, I mean, just, they're just yeah, brutal killers. Is what they're, they yeah, they're, they're hard, very, very hard men. Um, and interesting that this whole de- deal has been done by Lukashenko, president of Belarus, um, and Prigozhin, apparently they've been friends for 20 years. Um, and Prigozhin and his fighters are in Belarus now, um, you know, in exchange for immunity. Um, there's, there's news coming out now that, um, well, first of all, let me say that, um, there were huge rumors that the CIA were behind this whole thing and, I've seen a lot of Twitter with stories that really run the length of of that whole narrative. Um, but the thing that makes me mistrust that is, um, although I'm sure the CIA may have tried to have had a hand, but you will never get past the Russian FSB. I mean, all their leaders are surrounded by FSB operatives. Um, anything to do with the CIA must be um, picked up by them first. Um, if they wanted to pull off some sort of coup, although I, I as I this said, this wasn't I, a coup; it was an industrial dispute. Yeah, um, but now um, the fog of war is so thick, um, and you know you've got people like idiots like Lindsey Graham and Senator Blumenthal going on and on about how there's going to be this big nuclear threat from the um, Zaporozhia nuclear plant, um, which is under Russian control. But, you know, I mean... The Russians don't need to do that. I, and it would, that'd be... Mad. It's the other way around, surely. It's the other way around. Been... Their, uh, their, their hydroelectric dam either today. Well, Zelensky's been saying that for a while as well. And if the Russians yep. wanted to nuke anything, they'd just pu- push a button. Yeah. But, this whole but thing, they, though, they tried is to very... attack that. They tried to attack that last year, I remember, in September. And uh, even one of the UN guys from the... Um, Nuclear Inspection Agency um, said that actually it was in quite good hands with Russia and that the attack had come from the Ukrainian forces. There's just a lot of BS on both sides. But yeah. this whole thing with Prigozhin just remind, reminded me of that um, that movie Nobody with Bob Oden, Odenkirk as the main character and he goes up against um, Yulian Kuznetsov, the Russian mafia boss guarding the ob shack. You know, I don't know if you've seen it. It's hilarious. Um, but but the guy who's the 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 main Russian guy in there is a nightclub owning, you know, psychopath um, with all these hired killers all around him. Does all this crazy stuff, and it just reminds me of Prigozhin because, of course, he's got a, a background in you know entertainment, restaurants, and all of that sort of stuff before he got into the Wagner Group and and all of that. But it it just all looks very comical. I mean, you know. The, the, for years, the, the United States quivered in fear about Russia, and in, in some respects they still do, but Russia's military is not as good as they've, they've either pretended they are or the Americans assumed because it's been a meat grinder for a year. And Yeah, only one way meat grinder, though. <laughs> yeah, but but it's not only a only a one way meat grinder. I mean, it's verifiable the losses of um, tanks, for example. It's really obvious. Um, people who are watching these things that you know, there's a lot of stuff that's happened that we don't know about. But 
you know, the, the truth in war just disappears as soon as the shooting starts. Yeah. And I don't have a dog in this fight. I'm not pro-Russian or pro-Ukrainian. I think no, no. I think there's a pox on both their houses. And um, why we should care about this proxy war basically on behalf of NATO is is ridiculous. I mean, today it's been reported by the Moscow Times, um, which is now run from inside Holland. Um, they're, they're a left-leaning uh, paper that's very anti-Putin, but they were saying that um, Russian General Sergei Sorovkin has now been arrested. Nobody they saw that. Mm. Yeah, and he was on Prigozhin's side, and they're now claiming that there's a massive purge going on, on um, of the top military brass, which, of course, wouldn't be a surprise. Um, Prigozhin demanded that um, uh, the... Sergei Shogu, um, the Russian defense minister, um, that he resigned. Um, well, he hasn't resigned, or he also wanted the general of staff, Garamasov, to resign. But what's happened is that Sorovkin has been arrested. Um, and he was, remember, Soro- he was the one who ran the whole war in the yeah. Ukraine last year for three months, and he was replaced by Garamasov. Um, so it's it's a mess. But you won't detain, you won't deter Russia without a proper peace deal that gives them exactly what they asked for at the beginning, and that's no NATO incursion. That goes back to Minsk. That goes back to what? Yeah, it goes 2007 back to. It actually something. goes back to um, Khrushchev. Hmm, yeah, yeah. You know, wasn't he yeah. drunk when he did that? He signed that off or something. Well, I mean, it was something that the USA used to respect and NATO used to respect, but they don't respect it anymore. Um, no one can blame Putin for being so antsy about it and starting a war. In Ukraine, I'm sorry, um, I don't know if anybody's seen Tucker's like, latest um, that came out yep. yesterday. We played it yesterday morning. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, you know, this whole, the USA and the NATO people and people, idiots like Lindsey Graham are going, you know, and Joe Biden, of course, we've got to protect Ukraine in the name of democracy, in the name of democracy. It's like they are not a defining um, pillar of democracy, the Ukraine. They never have been. That's that that talk really annoys me. Mm. All right, okay. Glad we're not there. Oh, but what about not- the six billion missing? Um, uh, what about the Pentagon admitting that they had an accounting error and they were missing six billion dollars last week? Where's that money gone? Yeah, I wonder. Ukraine, or it's gone to Lockheed Martin Skunk Works. Yeah, UFOs that we don't know exist. And they're already here, apparently. Yeah. Okay, so anything more to say about that? No, it was an industrial dispute. That's an odd term to use, though, Cam. Yeah. Industrial I, dispute. I think it's a bit well, more than was, that, actually. He was a bit upset about getting a few of his troops bombed. His conditions. Yeah, it wasn't happy with the way things were running. You know, So um, we'll, we'll just withdraw from here and uh, we'll just have a... A but that, bit of that a, line that his troops were bombed, I mean, we have no idea whether that's true or not. But who cares? I don't. Well, well we care because it's a world war. You Nuclear. can't be that flip, my darling. You can't be that flip. Yeah, okay. Well, as I said before, I've I've drunk quite a lot of vodka with Russians and Ukrainians, and, and they're both, the, well, the ones I Equally was drinking mad. vodka with, decent people, nice, learned, thoughtful people, and it's... Um, Especially when they've got the vodka in. Well, maybe uh, maybe it sounded more so to me at the time as well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If they, can right. quote, if, if they can quote Dostoevsky, then they're a friend of mine. Yeah. <laughs> Chippy in China. 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 Mm. There you go, Olivia. Did anyone in New Zealand know that our Prime Minister was going up to China to a World Economic Forum meeting with the villainous Klaus Schwab? I thought New Zealand leadership having any relationship with Klaus Schwab was a crazy conspiracy theory. According to Grant Robertson and Sean Plunkett, it is. Yeah. How rude was he to Peter Williams over that, Grant Robinson? But the thing, I mean, of course, he's meeting with Xi Jinping just Ping, Xi Jinping, I've got to say that properly, um, as well, and that's happened. But, you know, can you imagine a soy boy like Chipkins conducting monetary trade negotiations with a hardened old communist imperialist like Xi Jinping? I mean, he'd be eaten for breakfast, so all we can expect is more sycophancy. Well, what, what we saw, though, is the insult to Hipkins from the moment he landed in China 
because he was met by some low-ranking official in in the regime, <laughs> not, right? Not even the foreign minister, not even the prime minister, right? So they sent some low-level functionary out to um, give him the glad hand um, as he walked down the stairs of the clapped-out Boeing 757 with its backup sitting in the Philippines. <laughs> yeah, I think about the, who was the – I mean, just to segue into that for a little bit, who was the fool in Hipkin's office who thought taking two 757s to China or, or at least one of them most of the way as a backup was ever going to have good optics? Like it, for, for a party that has been pushing the climate agenda – ad nauseum, talking about, you know, uh, we need to do have taxes on this and taxes on that to do climate mitigation and all this. And here they are taking two of the world's worst performing aircraft in terms of um, fuel efficiency. That's not true, by the way. But anyway, carry China. on. Well, it is, it is true on our planes because they're old and they haven't got upgraded engines. And There are no have, upgraded engines for that uh, aircraft. No, there are. There are upgraded engines that you can stick on them, and mm, a lot of the US mm, uh, things are doing them now, where they're saving twenty five to thirty percent. No, there, there, there is there is no update for the seven five sevens, either Pratt and Whitney's or Rolls Royces, and they don't make them the model of the engine anymore. So, yeah, yeah, it's um, <clears throat> they're good. They're very good aircraft. They're very good aircraft. They're good aircraft, but ours are old and clapped out, and they were old and clapped out when we bought them. We got them from God, the Dutch. Yeah, God knows why we bought those. I mean, cheap. Yeah, well, they weren't that cheap. Did you notice that uh, Carmel Cipollone uh, just basically counted the cost of fuel and, and justifying it, saying that it was cheaper? Yeah, well, and it's then she a, said it was nine years of neglect why the planes are breaking down all the time. Well, they've been in for six, so... They wouldn't be allowed to fly them if they didn't meet Boeing certification standards. They wouldn't yeah. be allowed to fly. No, that's right. I mean, they're, they're not a bad plane, but they're not they're, they're not in any way efficient or there's no way that you can explain it away politically. Why didn't they just go commercial? There's flights every day to China from Air New Zealand and, oh, and, and, and heaps of other, uh, uh, you know, airlines that fly backwards and forwards between yeah, Because China that doesn't make them look so important. Yeah, but and then you get met at the at the airport by a low-level functionary. They're, so they're always already treating you with contempt. Of course, and then, all, and then all of the state-sponsored media and in China um, starts lauding up how great we are because we're basically chugging the great lengths of Chinese, you know, um, sausage, and uh, and and sucking up to these guys, and and they're using that to say to the Australians and the Americans, well, this is how you conduct diplomacy, just like New Zealanders. They're yeah. a good hard swallow here, and we really are proud of them for doing it. Yeah, that. I know. It's so painful. That's, that's the it's sycophancy. It's just disgusting, you know, the, the sycophancy that we have to the Chinese government. These guys Because are- even even um, Nanaya Mahuta, you know, um, took her um, barcoded, face up there um two years ago no she didn't she was she was saying at that time as foreign minister that she was trying to signal to exporters that they needed to think about diversification um and the buffering aspects of something significant happened in china would they be able to uh, withstand the impact but this is just um more locking more business for new zealand there's no decoupling going on is what i'm trying to say there's not even a um, there's not there's not a trace of that kind of speech anywhere. It's just further def- genuflection to China um, in the name of free market. Um, but there's no free market inside China. Everything is overseen by CCP managers and bureaucrats. Um, and I want to say this, that for anyone out there who is under the delusion that somehow Vladimir Putin is taking on the globalists and the World Economic Forum goons to eliminate eliminate woke corruption and the Klaus Schwab's of this world, lo and behold, I again make the argument that Xi Jinping is neck deep in the World Economic Forum and his agenda. The surveillance, the eugenics, the big tech fascism, the totalitarianism, um, you know, social credit system, whole uh, digital currencies, everything. Yep. Fifteen Pandemic minute response. cities. 
Yeah, and the like, and all that. Virus. Stuff. China wants New Zealand to take off its um, take on it of its own accord, and it looks like we're going to. Um, and this, it's they are our overlords. They've locked us like wedlock into trade, and it's all money, 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 money. And at least Australia took at least a moral stance when they pushed back against China's um, hegemony into their economy. Um, we are not anywhere near that. Nobody in New Zealand speaks that language, and that frightens me. No, well, mm-hmm. it's it it's worse too when you consider that we went from. Uh, you know, Labor that was heading in that direction, uh, then to John Key, who was really a, a absolute sycophant to the to the Chinese, yeah. uh, you know, message. Um, we've had you know essentially Chinese spies in both the National Party and the Labor Party, who are yeah. sitting there as MPs. Um, we've still got the National Party receiving donations from CCP linked people in New Zealand, and they just they take the money, they never hand it back. They would just take it. You know, all that money that um, ended up in the court with a serious fraud office, you know, after the Jamie Lee Ross accusations, all that Chinese money, they never gave that back. It's still sitting in their accounts. So, you know, if we, everyone's saying, oh, you know, a lot of people on, on my website are saying, oh, national is the only way we can get rid of this government. And I keep saying, well, why is changing a red shirt to a blue shirt going to make things any different? Those, the two, um, p- major parties, their policy settings, especially on China, uh, you can run a, a cigarette paper between them. They're, they're just so similar. And lurching from one big party to the next big party and back again is never going to get us ahead, um, especially in dealing with you know, totalitarian regimes like China. But, but Cam, that's because any politician knows it would be suicide for them as a politician to bring that up, given how many business owners like their cushy deals with China. It's a moral lack of courage in Kiwis themselves. Well, that- I'll give you a, a personal example of that, right, of how much the National Party has changed. When my father was the president of the National Party and before that the Auckland Regional Director, he would get phone calls regularly from the ambassador, Chinese ambassador, ordering him to get on the phone to a cabinet minister or a senior official or whatever, and tell them that the, the regime, the National Party regime that was in charge, didn't like what they, these people were saying about China. And they would do this on a regular occurrence and ring Dad up and say this. And my father would point out to them in very strong terms that we live in a democracy. People are entitled to their opinions about anything, including on China. And so with respect, to Ambassador take your um, your orders and your directions and shove them. But there'll be nobody in the National Party today that would stand up to China. No. I mean, I, I can remember back in those days when, when it was Taiwan's national holiday, uh, you know, there would be s- scores of National Party MPs going to the function put on by the Taiwan, Taiwanese ambassador. And John Key actually stopped them going to that. He, he told his caucus, you're no longer going to go to anything to do with Taiwan. That's how insidious the slip in the National Party from being uh, freedom-loving, respecting people's personal choices, those sorts of things, how far they've slipped from that ethos to being toadies to the Chinese government. I have seen Simon O'Connor say say something in support of Taiwan. but uh, He's the only one, but, you know, everyone ignores him. (laughs) What would happen if we you know, just started to disconnect and we could pay a very high price. Well, we could, but where else are they going to get protein from? I mean, we've got something they want, but they they can stop taking that if they want. That's fine. That's that's the world of trade. But, you know, sometimes you've got to have principles and it seems that neither the Labour Party nor the National Party have any principles when it comes to China. Their, their pr- principles are for sale for, you know, a few CCP renimbi in the back pocket. Yeah, and I mean, this is the the time I, the thing I hate most about the times I'm living in, and maybe it's always been this way, and but I've just woken up to it, but it's that everyone is viable. Everyone sells themselves so flipping cheaply, yeah. you know, mm. yeah. and, um, for, 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 for things that are monumental and horrible and a lot far-reaching, you know, like a, a social credit system, 
Um, and it's, it, you're right, it is cheap because we just have seen in the last week James O'Keefe, formerly of Project Veritas, now doing his own thing. Yeah. Busting a BlackRock executive boasting about buying senators for ten thousand mm, dollars. Ten grand, yeah. Right, yeah. 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 I mean the, the problem isn't isn't tragic. so much that you can buy uh someone for that. It's more that there's a process of uh, elimination or selection in pro place to ensure that only viable people end up there. Good That's point. what bothers me. But that, but that, most people we've seen from the last few years, most people are viable. Who would have thought all our doctors would um, not repair to their Hippocratic oath, but would repair to their contracts with um, pharmaceutical companies and, over and above our and own well-being? And threats and intimidation. Nobody yeah. had any principles. Yeah. 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 They just thought back to how long it took them to get their medical degree. And, uh, I mean, you know, the, the one of the things about that, I mean, you know, there's a big veer off, but um, it, it was, you know, about a week after uh, she sent them a letter threatening doctors with um, deregistration if, if they stepped out of line, Jacinda Ardern said, actually, you know, the people you should really talk to are your GPs because they know you the best. So she, she just threatened them. And uh, then she was recommending, well, they'll they'll give you advice. Mm. I've just threatened them to give you the advice that, uh, and yeah, it's it, it's quite confronting the level of of corruption everywhere. So the bad optics, okay, the planes, but the bad optics really is that W E F totally image, right? And and it's, it's like they want to stick it in our face, or they are so unaware that people like us sit around not liking that. Well, I mean, and what does he? What what did he call them? The new champions. The swab. swab. Yeah, with the term he phrase he kept using. They have like, penetrated the cabinet. He has penetrated the cabinet. I wonder That's, what Chris Hipkins thinks about his penetration. Yeah. Well, <laughs> shut up. Quite like it. He probably yeah. likes it from upper he's, heart. He's seen he's it. He's got all. it from China, and he's also got it from Klaus. But the new champions, and and I had no idea that was actually going on until Chris Hipkins got there. There was no analysis. Just ah, oh, yeah, there he is. Just ah, uh, he's meeting with global leaders. That's the kind of global leader he is. I, yeah. I want to see somebody make Cla- Klaus Schwab say with a vein. I want to see him do that. There's a vein. There's a vein. There's a vein. I had a, a German friend once said, "This is the word in the English language that is most difficult." There's a vein. Visa vein. <laughs> what? Visa vein. You know, on the church steeple. Oh, with the vein, you mean? Yes, visa <laughs> vein. The church steeple. To nail his accent, you've just got to learn to say a crisis. Crisis. Uh, crisis. So, Cam, let me ask you, while I've, while I've got you here sitting right in front of me, what would uh, Winston Peters' um, uh, stance be on China and the the big problem and all our trade. What Have you talked to him about that at all? Briefly, I've had a couple of discussions with him about China, um, mainly, you know, as information would come up about the National Party and their donations and things like that. And Winston's got a couple of examples of when he was in China negotiating things with them and trying to get things going. He says the trouble you've got is you actually don't, you can't actually believe a word that they say. Um, you know, and he, I've seen him say stuff um, also about the WEF. He, he's not a big fan of them. Um, and he's certainly starting to realise that the UN and the WHO and the WEF in China are all pushing particular agendas that we are all supposed to tug our forelocks, doff our caps and agree with. And he's coming out more and more hostile to those globalist uh, organisations and their intentions for control of governments and countries and everything else in between. It's worth actually talking about what their their aims are because you never see discussion of it. We talked about it on Media Matters the week before last. And, I mean, the, the, there are about seven, you can break down to about seven points. They, they want to end national sovereignty. So nations submit to an arbitrary global rules-based order, global governance, the ESG stuff, uh, 
Yeah. Um, where all spending is dictated uh, by central banks and technocrats. Um, and the aim is no growth. So, you know, the IMF in here saying, oh, you've got to cool your economy. Yeah. Um, and to destroy energy efficient sources that force everyone into energy scarcity. And you can look at all of this is playing out. You know what it's talking about. Germany's power has gone up 500% recently. So uh, in want- the UK, where they've had to um, yeah. actually get. The, the wind power is actually failing badly, and they're having to fire up coal plants to um, to to take the base load. Yeah, yeah it's, it's not an accident. A, they, they want deliberate. dictatorship by corporate cartels. They want, um, and that's backed by global NATO, which will extend into the Pacific. Uh, they want total censorship directed by the media and social media cartels, and the ultimate aims depopulation they talk about a fair bit so you know well, that all sounds great oh and well, we need know, to use ai like to rewrite the bible well there's no yeah. there's no no discussion of it no isn't no that guy else. creep isn't that guy creep the one who wants to what's his Re- name harari yeah wants oh, to rewrite the know. bible yeah wants to wants a sensor to that can tell if you're gay so it can um decide what sort of billboard you see to sell your coke but, I but mean, these one. these these people are actually evil oh, they're, very evil. they're actually evil and you know, not a lot was made of Jacinda Ardern's links to the WEF, but she was deeply embedded with them. And still is. And didn't still you, is. you came out, Cam, and said that, didn't you, at some point? You said that she was evil. Oh, yeah, I did. She, she and you still evil. believe that? Absolutely. That was when, that was when um, she finally turned the police on us, that Cam, I remember Cam put out that piece, that it was if you use your police force to attack your own citizens. Oh, that, that was the threshold, right? Yeah. Okay, well, that was the turning point. So is Chippy evil? No, I just think he's yeah. stupid. Well, he's got to yes, be. He, he is, was he, in there. He's got to he be. He was in there working it, you know. He was, he was everything, everything that. He's the banal face of it, right? Yeah, Arjun yeah. was the maitre d'. The guy cooking up the evil was actually Hipkins and Robertson. You know, oh. so so he doesn't get off scot free. I give him no Napoleon and Squealer. But the thing is, is that Jacinda Ardern, for me, and I've met uh, I've met every prime minister from Muldoon onwards. Right, most of them are dead. The ones that are left and retired, and nobody cares about. Right, so I've met all of these people. I've had dinners with them. I've had lunches with them. They all try uh, all have tried to do what they thought was best, right? Now, Muldoon was ill-equipped to deal with the ill winds in the economy that he was dealing with. But he did do some really good things. And ironically, they're they're the very things that the green type people and and the Labour people opposed, like, you know, the the Think Big projects that um, Bill Birch um, brought in. Um, the the Clyde Dam, all of the, they all opposed all of those things, and they're all the things that are um, actually propelling and producing the power for their you know gay little electric cars, and they all opposed that. At the um, time. You know, and it was actually visionary of Muldoon and his government to focus on energy sustainability and self sufficiency in New Zealand, and mm. that absolute moron of a prime minister Jacinda Ardern on the face of 3,000 school children having a moan on the steps of parliament she went and saw them she'd go and talk to them on the basis of that she basically destroyed all of that investment in gas and uh, oil exploration in New Zealand on a whim from some screaming naughty kids yeah uh, I don't and think that so, is just evil it, it, the same thing's happening in Germany, and, and it's 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 in the line with those policies of WEF to to make energy more and more expensive. Yeah, she, she's she's a uh, she's just a screen and a keyboard, CPUs uh, uh, offshore. Yeah, but like, but like you know, we've got huge resources of coal in New Zealand. We don't dig our own coal up and use it in power plants or or in. Yeah, um, we, we bring in the other. We, crap. we bring yeah. in dirty, rubbishy Indonesian coal, and we sit there, virtue signaling to the world that we're clean and green, and it's bullshit. So the only thing you can surmise from all that is that this is a progressive, planned, controlled deconstruction. Yeah, absolutely. Of us. Sabotage of the Western way. And then you can even take that down into the social upheaval that's occurring and the lack of social cohesion 
and this pushing of these agendas, particularly around trans and all of this. The Chinese are funding all of this. Mm. They are causing disquiet and uh, discohesion in society because it suits their global aims. And the Chi- we have a three-year election cycle, and the Chinese don't even think in three years. Three years is a blip. They're thinking in thousands of years. And so what they're trying to do is cause the West to implode upon itself so that they can then roll over the top of that. with their From its own weaknesses. I mean, there's no way um, Chinese society would allow all the... Trends. No, that would never be tolerated. No, they, they allow no, us I, to be tripped I, up I, by our own weaknesses, and aren't we stupid? Well, I have, a, yeah. I have lunch every Monday with a Chinese mate of mine, and I said to him at lunch, there's a group of us all get together, about 10 or 12, and I said to him, he said to us, well, what's this, what's this trans thing? I don't understand. And I said, well, you know, the boys or girls who decide they're going to be the other... I said, do you have any of that in China? He goes, no, 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 not permitted, not permitted. He said, I said, what happens to them? Uh, they're not in China. <laughs> <laughs> the, the Chinese have a word, baiju, I think it is, which uh, is is the descriptor for the West, the people in the West pushing the agenda that's destroying us. They just they, they laugh at them. Mm. I'm a great admirer of of Taoism and the I Ching and just the the thinking in um, so much Chinese culture is fascinating and yeah, really thousands worthy of years of old, right? Oh, and most people have a sentence's worth of knowledge of it and dismiss it on that basis. It's very foolish. Mm. So, so can we say that the WEF and China are working hand in hand? They're all part of the same group, aren't they? I hand think so. in hand in glove. Hand in glove. Well, I don't know about hand and glove. There's, there's, there's probably an uh, alliance where their interests uh, uh, match, but uh, I'd say Chinese aspirations to start an, a consumer-led world order that overtakes the finance-led world order is a big part of what of the undercurrent of what's going on. Well, if you've got Biden who thinks that um, Putin's losing the war in Iraq, <laughs> which is what he said, then I don't know if there's any hope for anyone. No. Anyway, okay, should we, should we move on to the next uh, topic? National's problem with Māori. What is the problem? Who wants to talk about that? I'll, I'll talk about that because it's it's been, I mean, the, the deterioration of race relations in New Zealand really bothers me because, you know, coming from the East Coast, Te Taira Fiti, uh, I, uh, you know, it's 50% Māori. And so, you know, I have a lot of friends there and family. And just watching... Luxon fumble the ball. He he started out with the best of intentions, but you know he got um, I had her name, but he he got he got a lady when when he first took over. Arendi Hipango. Yeah, invited her to to the National Party conference, and she was impressed that uh, he'd done it then rather than six months before the election. Sareti Duri said. In Te Ao Māori, peace depends on mutual respect of mana. And I um, I don't, you know, there's a lot said about Pākehā's lack, lack of respect It's Māori. absolute bollocks, right? Peace, well, peace comes through superior firepower. That's not peace, that's conquest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's just bollocks. When you get, you know, people like Eddie Jury saying that, and uh, you know, if you actually try and discuss Māori topics, and they don't like you what you're saying, then you get held down as a racist, even though the valid points that you're making. And Eddie Jury is one of those people who does that. So he's saying, like, you all have to, we all have to have mutual respect. There's no mutual respect for national from Maori at all. Right? It doesn't matter how much the National Party bends over backwards to resolve historical grievances to do treaty settlements, to do all of these things and pour billions and billions of dollars into making things better for Maori. They get no votes. In fact, I know one MP or former MP, he had a spreadsheet and a calculation working out that the more money that nationals spent, the less votes they got from Maori. And he'd worked out that it, there was a mathematical calculation that if they just spent this amount of money, and it wasn't that large, especially considering the COVID fund and the billions spent there, 
that if National spent that money, they could completely eradicate any vote for the National Party by doing that. And so I don't think that National's got a problem with Maori. They bend over backwards trying to stand candidates in Maori seats, um, have all sorts of woke policies, start talking. You get you get these communists like Simon Wilson from the Herald, an avowed communist who's posing out loud about how the National Party needs to, you know, be more diverse, and they do all of that, and people don't vote for them. Maori just don't vote for National, and the ones that do vote for National aren't on the Maori roll; they're in the general roll. So I don't know why uh, National bothers to actually chase that vote because they just don't get it. They well, don't I think, get the vote. I think there's, there's, you know, the, when Chris Hipkins was going up to Auckland, to, I remember recently it was reported he doesn't have any contacts in business. It was kind of like after all this time he doesn't have contacts in business. But the uh, reporter said, well, it's not that he is hoping to convert these people, but middle New Zealand wants to think that he thinks about them. And I think, you know, there's a case to be made for National doing a similar thing. I think a lot of it, though, comes down to New Zealand just needs to deal with its legacy as a slave-owning country. I think a well, lot of it comes. But Maori owned, owned slaves too. That's what I mean. Right. That's what I, I'm talking I mean, about. In 1840, when the treaty was signed, all the rights and privileges of the ownership class of Maori were protected, including the ownership of slaves. Now, you think about this, right? Britain emancipated slaves 20 years earlier than that. They, well, a lot they, of the slaves went and worked for white folks, and that's why this real sensitivity about, yeah, but, about but that's the thing, people right? are on that side. When the treaty was signed, Great Britain didn't have slavery. They'd abolished it. That, they abolished it very early, didn't yeah, they? Yeah, very early. It continued to the 1850s, I, I think, roughly. But, roughly. but they signed a treaty in New Not Zealand that, in, that protected you know, if you think about, slavery. Yeah. Well, you know, if you think about the uh, culture around slave ownership, you could uh, take the fruits of a slave's labor without uh, reciprocity or recognition. You could denigrate their whakapapa on the basis of some past slight uh, as utu. Uh, if you had a child with a slave, that child would have mana through you. So it's very similar to Maori attitudes towards taxpayers. Yeah, very similar. Okay. We need a great and, and reset. I think at least we That's what we that. need. And it's not that New Zealanders are racist. I think they just don't like being treated like slaves. And I think it's time, you know, yeah. we maybe broach the subject in a loving way. <laughs> Possibly. It's like Les Patterson. I say it with love. I say it with love. I say it with love. Well, I don't like being treated like a slave. I don't like you getting all hurty feelings when someone says something to you and then you can say it to me. It's not fair. No. So that's the point I was making about the Eddie Jury, whether he meant it or not. He said it. I mean, it's but like he's, uh, Willie they Jackson. Say it. Well, Willie Jackson's the biggest racist in New Zealand. Well, I mean, you know. He, What's his net that. worth? Don't know, but, you know, I used to go on radio live with Willie Jackson and, um, you know, I used to get on all, all right with him, but he, he's just been slagging me off left, right, and center on social media and he forgets all the things that he said and done in the past. But. But you, you know, don't. <laughs> no, I never forget. But it, it's there just seems to be a willingness to accept racism as long as it comes out of the mouth of a Maori. Well, that's and, Marxism. That's Marxist, right? That's what that up-facing fist is all about. It means that whatever you do to the class uh, above you, it's justifiable. And that includes lying. Mm. So we've got to stop expecting honesty. Yeah. New Zealand's productivity. Well, yeah, and that's another another thing. I've that's I've another been, thing, and, and another thing. I've just been fretting about it because um, I, I've, you know, there's the um, I, I think it was the. You need to have your papers organized, Marty. Get that's yourself organized, there, Marty. I'll talk yeah. about I'll talk about uh, productivity. productivity. Take Auckland yeah. Council for example, right? Auckland Council has got a number. It's not an inconsequential number of staff members who are working from home where home is an overseas country. <laughs> what, what, what? They have a, a, a reasonable number of staff 
at Auckland Council that are working for home and have been doing so for a number of years where home is an overseas country. And the furthest one away lives in Spain. In the villa oh. by the pool. <laughs> right? So there's your productivity. Did you know that more than half of Auckland Council's staff are still working from home? And if you've been into the court Crikey. system, if you've been um, you know, watching what's happening in the court system, if you go and file anything or file a paper, you get an automatic response back from, from the person who you're, you're emailing, and it says, oh, due to COVID um, restrictions, um, there are delays in this and that. And you go into the court and everything is still on COVID restrictions and half their staff aren't even in the office. They're all working from home. And most government departments, you know, they, they, they were talking about the Wellington protests and how it was affecting business and all of that down in Wellington, these terrible unwashed people, um, you know, super spreaders um, causing harm to the business in Wellington. That's bullshit. The, the harm that was being caused to the businesses in Wellington was all the civil servants staying at home and drinking their coffees in Thorndon and Karori and Kandala rather than in the CBD because mm. they're all working from home and still are in many instances. Well, how could that be tolerated now? In the same way as the 28% increase in uh, the, the public sector over the past five years is tolerated. And the increase in the you know, in the minimum wage for no increase in productivity as a result. You know, I can remember back when I used to run a security company and we had $8 guards and $10 guards an hour. And um, the difference was whether or not they had a qualification. But, two bucks. But now those same security guards doing the same job with no discernible change in in in, in the operations of the jobs, they're all being paid 27 Thirty dollars an hour. Well, they're not worth that much. Yeah, but that's what you need just to be able to buy groceries now. Yeah, but 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 the job isn't worth that much. It, mm. it was it was pushing it at ten dollars an hour a few years ago. But uh, but yeah, the reality is, rant about that on Media Watch. You know, you sort of have you can't pay your best workers what they're worth because you're having to pay your worst workers what they're not worth. Mm. And uh, yeah. you know, and then they've got you know. The young people today, you know, we go, ah, oh, the young people. Well, they have mental health days. You know, oh, no, I wasn't feeling too good. Um, I needed a mental health day. I took that off. But do you need it every Friday or every Monday? What do people well, do on mental health days? What do they actually do, I wonder? I don't know. Ask Kerry Allen. Yeah, we'll get she's, to that. She's just had a few mental health days. Why do you just sit there and sort of meditate or something? Or? Well, there's, there's a, a, a phrase. I'll, I'll clue you guys in on some of the lingo because, you know, uh, there's a f phrase apparently used among um, Zoomers uh, called bed rotting. Yeah. yeah. Right. And it, it just means uh, presumably lying in your bed with no aspirations for anything more. Okay. So that's our productivity. You well, weren't feeling like a loser. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, there was a really good. Um, you'll get to the you'll get to the piece of paper at some point, Marty, and, and when you've got it, jump back in. All right. Speaking of mental health days, Kerry Allen, you know this story has been coming for a long time. I've been hearing about it for literally months that there was about to be a story drop about bullying in her office and you know staff turnover and all of that sort of thing. And sure enough, it finally arrived on Wednesday. What we're now going to witness from Kerry Allen as gaslighting on her behalf. And I'd put her as, up as a nomination for gaslighter of the week because she's, okay. saying, she's saying there have never been any formal allegations put to me, which you hear that coming from a politician, you think, oh, okay, were there any informal ones? You know, what, how does this work? You, you, you're being accused of being a bully. Are you surprised there's never been any formal allegations put to you? You know, um, if you look at her, you know, she's just had you know, a mental health break of a few days off um, because she's, uh, you know, just had, I think, her third relationship in 10 years collapse around her. And um, now she's facing up to these bullying allegations and saying, well, I haven't seen anything put to me. Well, of course not. You're a bully. No one wants to talk to you about it because you'll bully them. 
But even the term going, I mean, going going into the media and, I mean, we've all been through relationship breakups and they're very painful and they hurt and you might need a couple of days off. But to go and say, um, I'm struggling with my mental health. You're a minister that, of the that crown. Is so, Get, there's no dignity in that, is there? No, but she's a minister of the crown. Get a life. You mean you had a breakup? Gosh. And you're a bully. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or are a bully. Yeah, combine those things and it doesn't look very good, doesn't doesn't look pretty. So this is all a legacy of the dictator, the, the tyrant, Jacinda Ardern. She let all of this rubbish percolate along and Hipkins is having to come along and clean it up. But you know, you look at his roles, he was the leader of the house, he was, you know, chief whip. He knows about all of these things. COVID guy. Right. He but he was he was the enforcer of Ardern. So he wouldn't have known about all of these. The whips would report to him. They've known about all this stuff. Socialist bosses, man, they're the worst. (laughs) Speaking of bullying, um, um, Paul, I really liked your interview with Winston Peters. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, not, Not that you bullied him, but I felt that you were trying to get to, you were trying to get to the social media posts, right? Um, where he was gunning really hard for vaccination during 2021 and bullying the unvaccinated really heavily. But I felt that he derailed you or he didn't want you to get to them and you didn't actually name any of them. But I made a note here of some of the things that he actually did say at that time when he was bullying the unvaccinated in this country. I'm, I'm aware of what he said, yeah. Every, yeah. Everybody was bullying in in who was in Parliament at the time that, the key thing is with Winston is that he's realized that he he got it wrong. And that, that's why he's starting to talk about we need to be having investigations into uh you know the died suddenly stuff, the 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 things that have been yeah, the death rates and, 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 and yeah. that I, I saw that I saw his thing yesterday down in Dunedin and I'm glad that that went viral. Um, I, I, I can I answer your question, though. Um, I haven't heard an apology, though, from him um, yeah, you're, you're to the unvaccination. That's ne- what I want. You, you'll never hear an apology he from said he owned it. He said he owned it. Well, it's all very well to say you own yeah, something. Yeah, but, but, but this is a work of progress. And um, I was prepared to fire out those lines. But this is a very delicate time at the moment. Yeah. Well, let's just let's just remind people but, but of feel one free of those mind. lines. Of one of those lines. But, All people are seeing yeah. right now are the unvaccinated holding the vast majority of Kiwis and the economy to ransom at immense cost. Yeah. That was one yeah. of that line, one of those lines. You also, yep, you have to remember too, um, Olivia, that when that line was delivered, he was a minister of the Crown. In 2021? Oh, not in 2021, but prior to that, he was. So he had to go along with what Cabinet had decided. No, he went along with it of his own free will in 2021. Yeah, 2021 is different. We're talking quite late. So, but I, I want I want to get this out because go. Because, What's the next one? Well, it, it it's that you know he constantly made this push that it was the vaccinated that were holding the country to ransom when it came to lockdowns, which everybody you know, in everybody who was in power and in contri- was saying that from yes. Biden to everything. So, well, not everybody's the, running again in this current election. No, he no, but, is, but, so but what I'm just, saying to you is that that was the, that's what ninety five percent of our population thought too. Remember? I don't care. I don't care if people are morons. Um, no, what but I care about is that I, is, he is needs it, to apologise. He needs what, to apologise. No, what he to needs to do is not apologise. You can't. Uh, you can't apologise for things that you said in the past. Like that. That's the same sort of thing. You can. That that, that leftists yeah, I want us can. to apologise for things that happened in colonial times, right? No, and no, that's a really poor apology. comparison, Cam. That's a really poor comparison. We're talking. What's about more important that's... than an apology, Olivia? What's more important than an apology is actually putting it right. Well, both I'm telling you, all, I, all I'm saying anyone is anyone can for, say sorry. I could say sorry for no, lots no, of but I'm telling you, you will not get. He will not get the votes from the freedom movement, which he seems to be gunning for, unless he is prepared to say, "Look, I really got that wrong. Uh, you unvaccinated people actually held a line that needed well, to be I held." Would, I would. And, and he was not patient. in government then. So. I would be patient, Olivia. But anyway, let's hear what else he said, because that's fair enough that we hear them. 
This one really I find disturbing. Um, we urge everyone to get out this Saturday to get your vaccination. We need to get these rates up to get out of these lockdown restrictions. Um, but at 1pm, we need the Prime Minister to give us the plan out of this once we hit that target. Kiwis are desperately needing certainty for their businesses, livelihoods and their families. But, you know, the, 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 this is the thing is that you remember how hard that was to hold that line. We were getting blamed, neighbours, friends, family and all the rest of it, that we were holding the country to ransom through not violating our own bodily autonomy. It's that that Winston needs to address very very directly. Like in the interview with Youth Paul, I noticed that he kind of washed it away and said that, um, you know, he'd owned it, he'd owned it, but he's not owning it. That's I'm pretending to own it because I don't really want these things read out on, on media, but it needs to be um, addressed in a much more head on way. And I mean, maybe you could encourage him to do that, Cam, because I think people were really, really uh, hurt. The country was hurt by that. You, you got to wake it up slowly, right? That's right. You can't. You got to like, wake we, it up slowly. You can't spook those we horses. Saw all those horses what, what does that mean, Paul? I don't understand that. What, it needs to, I don't understand. It's not a red pill. It's a pink pill, but it ends up being a red pill. Yeah, right? you've like a lot of us. I mean, he, yeah. he just would have clammed up if I started going on yeah, like that. Look, you know, that us, was that was first base, and there are yeah, another two exactly. bases at home. A lot of us have given up talking to people who were locked into the vaccine, the whole narrative, and we just go, oh, whatever, not listening to you, it's just static. But there are people who have realised that there were some terrible things that went wrong in decision-making and went wrong when, in policy and all of those, and they are actually in a position to help undo some of the harms that went on with that. And a sorry doesn't undo the harms, actions undo the harm. Harms. Well, I'd and still so like that's, to see a sorry, actually. Yeah, absolutely. We all want to hear hear a politician apologize, right? We all do. I mean, it's like watching, it's like going to the I know the, it's as rare as a unicorn. It's as rare it's as rare. hell, right? It's why we go, but it's why we go to motor racing because we want to see <clears> the crashes, right? We're seeing a politician say sorry. You know, most of the time they think that sorry is a word that's in the dictionary between shit and syphilis. You know, that's basically what they think sorry is. Um, so, you know, I've seen politicians apologize for things and it's, you know, it's a lot like the Father Ted thing when Father Jack has to apologize to Bishop Brennan and he goes, I'm so, so, so sorry. Yeah. They're meaningless, right? Unless they're backed up with actions that are going to say, well, I made, I said these things, I did these things and, you know, I believe that I was hoodwinked. I believe that the information that we got from Pfizer, um, via and also well, that doesn't from, quite rub actually because we already knew. Well, well, we did. A lot of us we knew. suspected a lot of stuff, it was but all it's out only there. now that the documentation of the fraud that went on in the testing from Pfizer and getting all of these governments around the world with these locked in, you know, agreed things that they would say and do. It's only now that a lot of that stuff is actually getting out for the majority of yeah, people sure, to actually but, but, see. Sure, right? sure. But but at the the, I, the reason I brought that up on the back of the other thing was the bullying. It's like Winston was appalling um, in his bullying of the unvaccinated, people who were protecting their Lots own people, autonomy, yeah. and he should apologise for that, and I won't vote for him unless he does. You weren't going to vote for him anyway, Olivia. No, but I'm look. I'm I'm either going to vote for Winston Peters or I'm going to sit it out entirely. Small steps, and you've got to lead them to the water to make the horse. No, go. we need big steps. We no, no, need I, strong like, that's what, grand that's what, statements. That's what I was trying to do, just to make like, a start of it, chip away at a bit, and then more and more. Yeah. The guy gets more confidence in talking about it, and you end up with something. Correct. Amazing. Like the oh, Wellington. Heart attacks oh, up eighty three percent and strokes up twenty five percent. That sort yeah. of thing. Yeah. Yeah, but okay. What do you say to that? Then you start arguing extra about the people figures. dying each week in New Zealand. I know all about that. I've had friend a friend die, so I, I, I'm across that. Yeah. But but in the end, what is the alternative? Liz Gunn, a lovely, oh, lovely, beautiful woman. I but the, the the political party thing is delusional. Completely delusional. I mean, she's got yeah. five hundred people to sign up to say that they're members so that she can register this new political party, which is called, I think, NZ Loyal or something. I mean, it looks like they used an Etch-a-Sketch to design the logo. It's very amateurish. 
I would have uh, thought she would go for Winston Peters because she has a relationship with him and did that very good interview with him. Yeah, it's um, it's strange. I mean, she's very genuine. The problem is, is that they're deluded into thinking that they've got support because they signed up 500 members in, in well, a little over two hours. Well, is she actually deluded? Is yeah, she deluded? I think she, well, she I is. I mean, there's having a go at something, but then there's thinking that it's going to be a winner. I mean, they're two different things. Well, having a go, all credit. She's having a go. She's putting her name out there. And anyone who stands for public office get, should get a pat on the back for that, for giving it a go. But giving it a go and actually making a success of it, two different things. Well, I mean, I'm you what you mean by success, though, Cam. I mean, you know, my guess. And well, I've getting elected would be, it, a, would be I, a start. I guess that her view of success in this is going to be getting onto the hustings and talking about things and uh, – maybe getting some funding because she's got members to do advertising. I would uh, be surprised if she thought she was going to win, but I think oh, she wants to get a, a bigger what's audience. What's the point of standing for Parliament? So you can mouth off. Well, that's that's pointless. It, it's that's literally what we do all day, Cam. Yeah, but I get paid for it, right? But isn't I, that what people I have say if you want to do something, to show that stand I'm winning. for something? Well, you can show... Someone does it and then they get shot down. Well, no, they don't get shot down. You have to be realistic here. Liz Gunn needs to answer, answer the same two questions that I've put to Matt King and not got an answer from, that I put to Leighton Baker and won't get an answer from, to any of these third parties that are out there. The first, if they cannot answer a cogent response to these two questions, one, how are you going to get 150,000 votes? Or two, how are you going to win an electorate seat? Because those are the only two things that matter. And if they don't have a cogent answer to those two questions, then all they're doing is living on hope. And they will, won't, will not succeed. They will split the vote. And when you split the vote like that, and there's all these little parties that are hoovering up 10,000 votes here, 4,000 votes there, 3,000 votes there, none of them add up to 100, 150,000 votes combined but those all become wasted votes. And every time you waste a vote, that basically gets split 50-50 between the Labour Party and the National Party when they do the recalculations on the on the thresholds. That's why but, Winston Peters needs to apologise and clean up all the, get those votes. Well, it's a great, great statement. I don't want to fix that on Winston, but Cameron, you seem to know a bit about this. Will you see that unfolding of being upfront about it, addressing it front on to the level where someone like Olivia would go, okay. I don't right. know. I mean, I haven't had a full, you know, enough time really over some whiskeys and cigars to, to, to get to the bottom. Well, he must have seen the response. But he is. Um, to, it, to that. He, he, he is seen. very, you know, adept and finely tuned political antenna. And so he will. He will be watching what happens. He reads what happens on social media. He reads what happens on webs websites. He'll do the you Mike know. Moore thing of finding an angry crowd and agreeing with them. Well, you know, he's a, he's the consummate politician. He really is. I mean, you have to admire his skills and his longevity uh, and all do. that sort of thing, right? But he's he's not a stupid man, and I'll periodically, you know, have a conversation with him, and he'll say, oh, you know, I read an article that you wrote three days ago, you made some really good points, but you missed this one. You know, that's the sort of, he's actually reading stuff and then giving feedback. And so, you know, it's early days yet, but I, I hope to see him come out of his shell. On it's some not of these early things. days. It I'm is sorry. early it's, days. It's not. We are, we are 14 weeks away from an election. As everyone keeps saying, it's an ex incredibly important election as we sleepwalk. Well, he said it was the most important one. He said that himself. Yeah, I, exactly. Okay. He did say okay, that. Olivia, so it's not early go. days. No, hang on. Let, let me address that. Yeah. And, and this doesn't apply just to Winston. It applies to every politician, right? But, but in particular to Winston. So if he did come out and apologise, like you said, I can see right now all of the blue rinse gnats with their blinkers on. What they'll say is, oh, he'd say anything for votes. You know, he's got all these bottom lines and he never delivers anything. He betrayed us in 2017, so oh, it doesn't matter that he's apologised. These are the lines that my readers say about Winston Peters 
they are not ever going to open their ears to that. It is locked in inside the National Party that Winston Peters is an evil you know, person that we must never want to deal with and we must try and destroy him at every opportunity. And the same goes for inside the Labour Party. Ask Rory Nam's parents what they would like to hear. Yeah. Hopefully we'll get there. Baby steps. Exactly. All right, folks. All right. So that's, that's us for another week. Uh, thank you, Cam. Thank you, thank Marty. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Olivia. Thank you. You're welcome. And- RCR with Paul Brennan. Reality Check Radio.